Hey guys, it's Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend and a co-host of the Real Blend podcast here to introduce a special episode of the show where we have the creative team behind the new Netflix science fiction show Three Body Problem. And you might recognize some of their names. Uh, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss were the create co-creators of the Game of Thrones show on HBO, and they are teaming up with Alexander Wu, who is their uh, screenwriter and main narrative plotter for Three Body Problem. Um, And it's a complicated story. It's adapted from a very popular science fiction novel. Essentially, there's a scientist who makes a a pivotal decision back in the 1960s that has direct implications on a group of scientists in uh, present day. And believe me when I tell you that that is basically the tip of the iceberg. Um, When you are getting into the premise of the show and all the different places it's going to go, uh, you do have uh, an incredible cast who's working their way through it. Uh, And the showrunners who are talking about uh, the complications and having the patience to sort of dole out uh, a complicated and scientific story over the course of multiple episodes. I believe that Netflix is dropping this as a complete binge. And it's one of those types of shows that when you get to the end of one episode, it immediately propels you through to the next one. So uh, Jake and I were able to sit down with uh, all three of the guys uh, when they brought the show to South by Southwest. And it's worth noting that um, we tried to limit most of the conversation to the first two episodes of the show, which is what they agreed to screen at South by Southwest. So you can go into this conversation and, and learn a bit about their process and their hopes for the show and how they sort of set it up without giving away any of the major things that are going to be going on uh, over the course of the main run. So without further ado, let's dive right into our conversation on behalf of Three Body Problem with David Benioff, D.B. Weiss and Alexander Wu. Before we get going, can I geek out and show you guys one thing? Mm-hmm. Sean knows what I'm going to. This is my dog Daenerys. <laughs> I, just to, uh, I just had to show you guys and just <laughs> maybe don't show Amelia though. I have, oh, and you to have. the point where now she asks about her. Really? Yes, yes it is. Wow. It is a, a video I post on my Instagram every day. Oh, <laughs> proudly. Yes, he's he's very very proud of that. I'm going to start with an easy icebreaker. Uh, any of you guys can jump in and grab it if you want to. Uh, do you guys believe in God? <laughs> or maybe Santa Claus. Maybe we can start with Santa Claus. I, I do believe in aliens. Okay. Um, as far as God goes, uh, I grew up a believer, and these days I'm kind of there's a line in Hamlet that I'm going to mangle, but one of you guys will get right where he says the universe is stranger than is dreamt of in your philosophy, mm-hmm. right? Close. <laughs> I was like, how long will it take Alex? So I Chris, you're correct. This, this, this universe, how long will Alex be able to resist? What's the actual line? That line? <laughs> no, I, the thing is, I don't know the actual line, but it reminds me of like, because my, my wife. There are my more wife, things in heaven and earth that are dreamt of in your philosophy. My, my wife nice. said to me about a, about a week or a half ago, I, I, I love that this is going to be preserve and posterity yeah. uh, because I'm, I'm so obsessive about details she said you love pedantry don't you <laughs> <laughs> and what I should have said I mean pedantry was nothing because yeah. that yeah. is no. the right thing to I was going to say I, I know exactly what you said but I couldn't resist <laughs> That's oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, that, uh, uh, she gave what uh, her best approximation of a good-natured laugh. At that, but but it, How it could only. You that? I mean, that one is too. It only proved. Her, right. It only served to prove her point. <laughs> if she's gonna throw you, it's almost entrapment at that point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I, <laughs> yes, getting back to the original question, yes. which is a really good question. I, I think the universe is strange. I, I don't think any of us really know what's going on out there, sure. and I certainly don't. But I do believe in aliens. Good. I'll go with that then. Um, Alex, I wanted to ask you specifically about, th- there's a unique challenge to this show in terms of having to early on educate the audience really quickly on a lot of big topics, um, but also tease out your reveals. I think one of the best things about this show, and I've watched the entire thing, is that you get to the end of an episode and it immediately compels you forward. Can you just talk about your process about plotting that out and making sure that you weren't overwhelming people with uh, information and still having these narrative dramatic teases? Uh, boy, it, it's it's a big challenge that that you know we spent uh, the last four years uh, you know iterating and reiterating on. But uh, you know, at the heart of it, when, what we want to do is to preserve that, that, that the spirit of, of the feeling of when you first read the book, which is always, it just 
it starts off as you know historical as historical fiction. It's you know it's 1960s in China, and then suddenly you're in a murder mystery, and then before you know it, you're inside. You know, you're thinking, well, I, I'm looking at the cover. This should be a science fiction novel. Where's the science fiction? And then you're 150 pages in. Oh, that's how oh, it was there all the time. And having that feeling is 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 something that we really wanted to translate. Even if the the details were not all going to be the same, just the necessity of adapting to a different medium. Not everything is going to be the same, but the, the, that, that experience of, of wonder and awe that we got that made us say, we have to adapt this book, you know, is what you want the viewer to experience too when you're watching this show. And, and kind of always being a little just like, you know, on the wrong foot is, 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 uh, is, is a key. And that's why it's, it was important to us to start the show. Like the book starts with something that doesn't seem at all like science fiction right. at all. Yeah. Um, but also there's the challenge of presenting a piece of history that doesn't get told very much at all uh, in, a, in a very succinct period of time. And a lot of the credit goes to our director, Derek Sang, on that, who um, took painstaking detail to, to make every bit of that, uh, uh, um, to honor that part of, uh, that part of history. Uh, his family went through it. My family went through it. And, and it, uh, interestingly, when we auditioned uh, uh, actresses to play the young Ye a lot who are from China, we asked them, how much do you know about the Cultural Revolution? And oh, wow. they said, not really. Wow. <laughs> they didn't really teach us much about it. Yeah. So it's not, it's not something that's taught a lot in, uh, in China and certainly not filmed a lot. Uh, so uh, there's a great responsibility to tell that part responsibly, too. To open with, wow. it's bold. Yeah. yeah, it's really bold. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned the books. Um, you guys have something in this situation that you didn't have on Game of Thrones, which is a complete series. Like the, the books, the series is done. You had the last book. I'm just sort of curious how that changed your creative process, the difference between not having the final book written versus having the final book written. Well, in the case of the specifics of the ending of this series, it was a, we knew that there was a finished trilogy, and so we're reading it, you're reading it. And as you get to the end of, of the trilogy, you're, you're wondering where it's going. And without spoiling anything, we found the ending of the book so, uh, just so moving. And I mean, and it's very strange, but like in a beautiful kind of wondrous way. And so having that at the end of the story, it just became, that was, I, I knew when I finished that last page and went over to him, his plane seat where he had finished the last page 10 minutes earlier, and we looked at each other without, before we even really said anything, we knew that we have to try to make this because if you can get people to that point with characters that they love and care about, it's going to be a pretty, a pretty amazing and, and impactful way to go out of the series. So, yeah, it, it, I mean, having an ending, not having an ending in general, I, I don't have much, that's a different question, but with this specific ending, we felt like it was extremely powerful and extremely worth, worth devoting ourselves uh, to many years of, of work on the show to get to that point. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I wasn't on that plane because if I saw the two of you, and you were both reading the same book, and then in the middle of the flight, one of you went over and spoke to the other, I would just the whole time be like, what's going on? What's going on? Like, I, I would have been obnoxious on that flight. So, so be thankful that I wasn't there. So the last time we went to Austin together uh, on the flight back, and, and we've always been like slightly paranoid about you know like people looking at, over your computer screen seeing what you're working on. The last time, do you remember this? The last time yeah, we yeah. went to Austin, was, we were working on Thrones, the seventh season or the eighth season, whatever it was. And Dan was typing, and then a week or two later, this guy is on a podcast, and he's like, "So I was sitting behind DB Weiss on a plane. I happened to see what he was writing <laughs> on. Oh, no." It was like a comedian or something who was here for South by, yeah. and he went on a <laughs> podcast and was like, and I saw the words I saw were, and and so I was like, wow, we thought we were paranoid. And after we that, after that, like you have to watch like cuts of a show on the plane. So, and I literally, I had to finish a cut of the show between taking off and landing because we were just we were behind. And, but I'm in the middle, it was like the paranoid yeah. thriller. I'm like in the middle of this plane cabin wondering, the overwhelming likelihood is that nobody gave a shit. But like, you, 
didn't know for sure, so I took the flight blanket and I put it over my head. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know what people thought. Because they saw something you, illuminated you under the blanket. You could be doing anything. I'm sure, actually, point. I was going to say I don't know what they thought I was watching. I'm pretty sure they, I know they, what they, you they know thought exactly I was what watching. They thought. <laughs> there would be times where, yeah, even before that, we'd be working on an episode, we'd yeah. be watching an episode to make notes for the editor, and, and you see the person next to you. This is like early on before we were worried about people like, you know, tweeting something. It was more, oh God, they think I'm watching a porn. No, it's actually it's this a show on HBO. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of nudity. <laughs> it's a fantasy show called Game of Thrones. I, I don't want to focus on this too, but like, what was the scene that that you were typing that the comedian saw? And was it was it like a big? You know, I don't. I remember it happening, and, and I remember the feeling of like realizing that it had happened. I don't remember what. That's it was. insane. That's, pretty That's funny. insane. <laughs> I want to get into the concept of virtual reality, uh, which is an important component of this show. And my, I have uh, boys, they're now 16 and 20. So over the years, I've, I've seen them play with different variations of, of, uh, of the technology. And whenever I watch them, I'm always like, this is ridiculous. Stop it. What are you doing? And then I put it on, and it's so engrossing, right? Like, I can't get over it. So I want to know what you guys learned. Like, what did you do to explore it? Um, and what did it teach you about what you can show and can't show? We it just... we. Were, Netflix was kind enough to invite us all to the Super Bowl. And at the Super Bowl, two rows in I front know. of us, there was a guy with one of, I think, one of the Apple the headsets Apple okay. standing up. And he was, what you could see through the, he was watching the game, but I think he was also he was DJing. Also like at the same time, he was, he was doing he, finger he, gestures. DJing? He looked, he looked like he was like virtual DJing his own. And how tracks. much are the, is each Super Bowl ticket? Isn't like like ten grand for those? I don't know because we were. So this were, guy went there and used it to yeah to, to DJ. And and the first thing I thought was, this is the most ridiculous looking person I've ever seen. Sure. And the second thing I thought was, in ten years, everybody's gonna be this guy. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody's gonna be DJing yeah. their way right down the street. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My my girlfriend just watched Ready Player One for the first time, and we kind of looked and we we're like, that's that's where we're heading. Yeah. yeah. Just everyone yeah. living in those trailers. But it is. Movies. It is so obviously like a. There were there were some false starts along the way. I remember the promise of it like just kind of popped up even in the. It popped up in science fiction, like with the Neil Stevenson book *Snow Crash*, and it, and it was in the between that and the Matrix, the idea of virtual reality was around for a while. But then it it didn't develop quite as quickly as people thought, and then people forgot about it for a while. But some people didn't, and they just kept working on it. Right. And now they got it to the place where it is. I went to my son's, who is I mean he's 15 now, but we we went to a, a kid's birthday party, which was one of the VR like experiences. Yeah. And you might feel silly with all that stuff on, but once you put the thing over your eyes and there are like zombies or whatever coming at you in a haunted yeah, house, yeah. It, is, it is immersive, even at the real low res version. Sure, yeah. So what we were thinking, and it diverges from the book a bit this way, uh, in this way, is we were thinking, well, if we want to show, if we want this to seem like something that came that is connected with aliens who have a, are, are almost a higher power. Going back to your God question, it, it can't look like the VR looks now, and it can't even really look like VR is going to look in five years, which is probably going to be pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Right. It's got to look like something that's impossible mm -hmm. for any technology that we have now. It's got to be. It's got to be something that's just a direct sucking you out of your world into right. another world so that that really informed the way we the way we conceived those sequences the way we shot those sequences mm -hmm. made it a lot more complicated because even a very high-end animated version and some of the stuff that if you look at like love death and robots some of the stuff mm -hmm. they do on that show is really leading edge like on the animation front in terms of the photo real animation but even that if it looks like that well that's on TV now. That already yeah. the fact that it's on TV now meant that it was not nearly far enough along. So right. we went for kind of a hyper real, uh, you know, reality instead of something that looked at all like a video game. Do you mind me asking? Did you guys use the volume at all, or was it traditional blue screen? Or we talked about using the volume, and then we didn't use the volume. Do we use it at all? We didn't use it. We at didn't. All. What we the lighting setup we used Just wasn't. It wasn't. It was an interactive it. lighting system that was much bigger than any volume. It was. A, it filled the whole sound stage, but it wasn't. We weren't in a volume. You're capturing what is like 
on the screens right. in camera. This wasn't that. This was about creating like advanced, very precise interactive lighting yeah. effects for precise specifically for three suns moving at the same time. Okay. Like to to get that on the peep the things you things and people you were shooting, it wasn't so much about like we, you were never actually looking at the stuff that was being projected. Yeah, gotcha. we, we got to visit the Mandalorian set before the show aired and, and saw the volume and were really impressed by it. And mm -hmm. then when we started prepping the show, our VFX team, what we learned as we were researching it is you have to have the VFX done ahead of time if okay. it's going to mm -hmm. be projected on the screens. Mm -hmm. And that's tricky, and it, and it really changes the whole process. And we kind of like the old way of doing it where... Mm -hmm. You shoot something and then you're figuring out the VFX as you go after you yeah. have the footage. Mm -hmm. So um, I think both methods can work on, on different shows. For this one, the people we work with who are like Steve Colbeck, who is our VFX czar, all through um, starting with second season of Thrones, but all through the end of Thrones, you really wanted to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And what Steve says, we trust. Go. <laughs> and that's every season is did it, especially with this show, more than any show any of us have ever worked on, every season. The requirements and demands of every season are different, and I could see there being things where, t if we get another season of the show, I could see there being things next season, for instance, that would be very volume mm -hmm. yeah. appropriate. Oh, gotcha. cool! You know? gotcha. Very cool. But it's oh. just, it, it, just the lead time and everything else. The, the, yeah. the workflow is completely different. You got to get way out sure, ahead yeah. of it if yeah. you're going to do. I it. I didn't think sense. about that. That's a, that's a good point. Um, I read a story about this show, and I'd love to know if it's true. And if it is, I'm going to ask an, a follow-up question. But I read that. Uh, we could have gotten this show sooner, but we were, uh, you guys were, were basically done with it. And then at the last minute said, wait, there's one more scene we have to do. And that scene happened, well, the, the idea, right before the strikes. And because of the strikes, it delayed the whole thing. I'm assuming you're nodding because it's true, because now my follow-up is going to be, what was the one scene that made you guys go, it's worth waiting well, to do this? we would ask you, do you know what that scene is? No. Mm have -hmm. you seen the whole season or just the first? I've episode? seen seven episodes. Seven, seven episodes. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, it's in, it's in it's there. In the first it's in there. You've seen it. It's in the first episode. It's in the first, episode. Episode. In the the first, first episode. episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not necessarily because it's not a bunch of whiz bang either. You know, it 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 it, it, it lays some foundational groundwork that we felt, we felt was uh, was missing. <laughs> I'm trying to think. <laughs> How was I'm it? Trying to think. Is it set in the '60s or is it set in present day? Present day. Present day. Present day? Is it the blinking sky? No. Blink is guy. We're gonna waste too much. Yeah, time. Yeah, it's gonna be the rest of my. It was a scene in the bar with Jin and Augie, where they where they first where she first sees the countdown and they and they're discussing where they tell you what they do and. and oh, and okay, interesting. Okay. But it's a couple things that it does. One, it establishes the onset of the countdown, mm -hmm. which is something that we had. You know, without that scene, we were kept, we were meeting Augie in medias res, already experiencing the countdown. So that it gave us that. But also you know, to explain what the problem is with science being broken, because Saul hints at that in the in the scene with Vera. That you know these things, it's impossible. But it, 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 we're still not really entirely sure what that means, right. and so we had this you know scene with Jin showing you know the experiment on the cell phone to Augie, and even if you don't necessarily know what those squiggles mean, which almost everyone in the world wouldn't know, the idea of two very brilliant people they're looking red. At this, you they know, started red, squiggles red, start red, out well, like red. Blue. Red is never good. And then they turn red. Right. You know, so red means something's going uh, wrong. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. The, so. fr the phrase "your bugs" will haunt me for. <laughs> But I am curious as a follow-up to that, like, how often do you guys get to the point where, like, you're about to put the period on it and it's done and you go, shit, we gotta, we gotta do this one last thing. A lot. Uh, that, that's often. a pretty common? Yeah. I mean, with, with everything. With scripts, you know, like, before you shoot a scene, like, sometimes on set you're changing lines of dialogue in the middle of a scene because you realize you're like, oh, she's saying the word uh, 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 celestial twice in two sentences. That's so stupid. That's so boring. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you change it so that she's not repeating the same word. Or... As you're listening to something, you realize, like, well, that doesn't really make sense, or she wouldn't say it that way, or whatever it is. And sometimes, you know, you're writing for the voices in your head, and sometimes when you hear the actual voices saying something, you realize it doesn't sound quite right, so you make changes. Sometimes in post, when you're editing, you realize, like, this would have been better if he had said X, and then you get Benny Wong to come back and do ADR, and on the back of his head, you give him a new line. Right, so right. we were writing up until the very end, and then past the end, I'd say. Wow. Um, I want to ask about choosing your directors. Um, a, I was surprised you guys didn't try to take on an episode. 
I don't want to find out why you didn't do that, but I was really happy to see Andrew Stanton's name yeah. brought back <laughs> to retirement, um, who I love, and I actually love his John Carter, and I want you know that to get more love. Um, can you talk about bringing him out of retirement, and then also just explain why you guys didn't grab an episode? I was just thinking of Andrew when you were talking about the VR headsets, because he has now one of the Apple ones, and he was telling us that watching, he can watch, what was he watching, Lawrence of Arabia? Oh, on like the, the thousand inch screen? Yes, yeah, something like that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, like watching it, like you can choose the row at the Man's Chinese Theater that that you want to sit in and he's like the sound is incredible the visuals are incredible it's like it's I don't want to want one, but you're making me <laughs> <laughs> like I want to feel, feel better one. than everyone else and, and, yeah. and make fun of the guy at this. And then if it gets boring during Lawrence of Arabia, you can start DJing. <laughs> <laughs> Cheer, Peter O'Toole. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew is someone who we've all admired for a long time. I've probably seen his movies. You know, it's weird because you think about how many times I've seen. Uh, Wally or mm. or uh, Nemo. No, yeah. no, geez. Like I have three kids, about, so I've watched. Talk about a movie that's going to outlive oh. everyone in this yeah. room. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. right. All the Toy yeah. Stories. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's he's probably there's been more hours of screen time of his movies shown in my house than any other filmmaker. Most houses. Yeah, yeah most houses. houses. Yeah, right. honestly. Uh, we never thought there was a chance in the world he'd want to come play with us, and I think Alex. Brought it was Alex's him. idea. Yeah. He, he, like that's he, crazy. He had come to. Uh, interview for uh, for my last show, and it, it didn't it didn't work out. But I always read that he's a really nice guy. Like uh, yeah. this is this he's the nicest guy in the world. Such yeah. a nice guy, and and we had that that episode three, which was so heavy with the video game stuff, right. and you know, all the interviews with directors th that we had. Th Everyone, to one extent or another, expressed some like this is not something that I'm mm -hmm. like it, that comes to me instantaneously. Like I know exactly how to do this. Sure. You know, everyone was willing. Certainly, everyone was willing. But you know, and and Andrew, of course, you know, was not intimidated at all by it, or at least like didn't give off that impression. You know, because we thought like, okay, you know, who, he who, asked for. He said if, if there was one that I'd like to do, it's the one that. Everybody else who you'd been talking to at that point was kind of wary of because no he's kidding, like, really? I know wow. what to do with this. Wow, that's great. Wow. Um, and can I ask why you guys didn't grab one? I think uh, when you're doing a first season of a show and you're show running a first season, there's so much work involved. There's so many meetings you have to attend, and you want to be on the set all the time right. for all your different directors. And because of the way the show is cross boarded, and this is a Bernie Caulfield special, so. Uh, you know, the show is cross boarded. We have, we have all the scripts done way ahead of time. Um, and oftentimes there are two different directors working on the same day, and we wanted to be everywhere. We wanted to be in all the meetings. We want to be in all the sets. When and what happens when you're directing an episode is you're not there for a lot of the other stuff. And if you're in a third season or a fourth season of a show, it's okay because you've got like a well-oiled machine and you can take that time and, and and direct your own episode. But on a first season, we just did not think that was uh, a good idea. Yeah, that's well, fair. Yeah. Um, this might be a bit of a silly question, but before I started watching the show, I didn't know what the term three-body problem meant. So I, so I Googled it, and, and in the world of science, I learned that it's, it's an unsolvable problem. They haven't figured out a solution. I'd love to know, what is your creative or professional three-body problem? What is, a, what is a problem that is that you guys have been trying to, to, to you know, how to, how to crack a particular story or how to shoot a particular moment? Or what, what is the moment, what, what is your equivalent of a three-body problem? Hmm. That's a, good, that's a really good question. I feel like Alex has a funny thought because I, I see it. his eyes lit up when you ask that question. Like, <laughs> what is happening that's, in your it's weird It's just my brain. face. <laughs> my face just says, does things that my brain doesn't do. <laughs> it's doing. And, and I, I, you know, I, the thing I think of is like, you know, there's as much art as, as much art as craft in 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 making a, a TV show, and if there was a formula, if there was a you know an equation that we could do and just plug it in, it would be so easy. But then but, it wouldn't be good. Yeah, it wouldn't be good, and and it wouldn't work either. No. either. There, there, there's it's an uns, every new project is its own kind of unsolvable equation. You have to figure out how to make this mm -hmm. show work. So you know, even though uh, David and Dan had made Game of Thrones, not every lesson from Game of Thrones is applicable to this, you know? Uh, I'd done shows that were adaptations of, uh, of, of, of books. Um, I, None of that is applicable to this. This is its own thing. So, you know, every time you're just starting almost like as a beginner again to like, how do we tell this particular story? 
Yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking for a specific thing, there's in book three, there's a sequence that hopefully we'll get to if, if you know, the gods are good and we get to a season three of the show, um, which I can't understand. I don't know how to shoot it. I don't know how we would do it. It involves multiple dimensions. You know, how do you show three dimensional creatures like us in a three dimensional spaceship entering fourth dimensional space? I don't know. <laughs> a problem for another day. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, we're yeah. getting the wrap, guys. I wish we had more oh, time. Thank so. you so much. Yeah, hope you guys are really great. Yeah, we'll yeah. hit you with some new questions. We want to thank our good friends at Netflix for getting those guys onto the show. Um, I, I, I'll limit my conversations to this. I did get a chance to see uh, all of the episodes of Three Body Problem, but I'm going to talk about the first two. And I want to let you guys know that um, this is the type of show that will reward your patience. There is a lot of story to set up um, and the science fiction can be pretty in-depth. And there are a lot of characters you have to keep track of. It's a, a bit like Game of Thrones in that sense, where there are a number of threads that are happening at all different times. It makes it very clear where you are at, at any given point in the story, whether it's set in the past or in present day. That's easy enough to follow. But there are a lot of character motivations that you're just going to have to sort of go with and, and assume that the show is going to play it out uh, a little bit later as the episodes progress. And without question, those payoffs arrive and are really worth your time. So if you put three body problem on give it the first two episodes at the very least see how you feel especially about the reveal at the end of episode two uh, and then decide whether you're going to go forward from that point on netflix is is betting big on this one uh they envision that if uh Betty Off and Weiss and, and Alexander Rue want to keep going with this. They could get, um, I believe, three full seasons out of this series. And I, I, I hope that they do because I'm intrigued by where they went with it. So you can start watching Netflix. Uh, you can watch Three Body Problem on Netflix beginning on March 21st. And in the meantime, we have plenty more content coming to the Real Blend podcast. So make sure you hit subscribe and turn on your notifications. You'll be the first ones to hear when a new episode drops. And as always, we appreciate you guys coming by to support the show.